get up here that often anymore. So if you're a visitor today, bear with me, but uh, we'll try to hide it as best that we can. And uh, I have done this a few times before, and I think it'll be a, a blessed time together this morning. I'm pretty down to earth. Those of you who know me uh, realize that, and hopefully you're glad of that. I call Pastor Rob. He's the professional one. I'm the guy that just, you, you are what you get when you see me, right? And so... Nonetheless, God's word is deep, God's word is challenging, God's word is for you and for me to live by. And the title of the message this morning is Feeding, Feasting, or Forgetting. To lay some groundwork, I want to use this illustration, if I may. Uh, We men who are involved with the men's breakfast uh, quarterly are working our way through this book called Point Man by Steve Farrar, or Farrar, not really sure how he pronounces it. And in one of his chapters, he talks about men who are spiritually bulimic. Now, years ago, it was a little more in the headlines, anorexia and bulimia. We don't hear it so much anymore, but he goes into quite a bit of detail using that as an example of what it's like for us men who don't walk the way we should, according to Scripture. He writes, like a young woman who eats and then promptly throws it all up, He reads and then quickly casts the meaning aside and goes on into his day spiritually malnourished. While he may look fit on the outside, after a month of this, he begins to resemble an Auschwitz skeleton on the inside. Now that's good stuff. That's pretty graphic, is it not? And the thing is, gentlemen, and eventually ladies, I'll pull you in too, uh, God sees just what we look like, right? on the inside. There's no hiding things with him. I would dare say, uh, and pastors like I am, we talk shop a lot, it seems that reading our Bibles has fallen on hard times. And it follows that if we don't read our Bibles as much as we should and could, then we're probably starving as well. We're not feasting on the Word and deeply meditating on it as well. The two really go hand in hand. So I want to speak to that this morning. There's not a whole lot that I'm going to say That is new to you, perhaps, but it may be new because you haven't been practicing it. And so it's always a good subject. It's always the answer for life as a Christian. Someone has said that the Bible has all the answers. All that remains is for life to provide the questions. But too often when we have a question, we try to solve it ourselves, and we don't really go to Scripture for it. I want to talk about the benefits of doing that this morning. The Bible makes exceptional use of metaphors, okay? Uh, Hopefully you remember what a metaphor is. Basically, some of my students would say, a metaphor is just a simile without the like or as. Well, kind of, but think of these examples. Jesus said, I am the door, okay, for the sheep. Is he really a door? Well, no, you can't hang him and turn a doorknob. But you understand the illustration. You go in and out through him as the door. Uh, Another time he says, I am the vine, and we are the branches. Now, we're not really branches, and yet we understand the illustration, and I'll get back to that later in the message. And there are others as well wherein he says, I am the bread of life. Now, we don't really eat him, and yet John 6 talks all about feasting on him and taking him in so that spiritually you might find your sustenance in Christ. So we miss all of this when we really don't take seriously the Word of God. And another uh, idea that I want to bring to your attention this morning is that just as physical food strengthens your body, spiritual food strengthens your soul. And it's possible to look good on the outside while we're starving on the inside. And it shows itself in a variety of different ways depending on who the person is. But it's there. And it's not often hard to spot if you're looking. And so this morning, we want to get past spiritual bulimia, if you will, by visiting some key passages that I think will help us to draw some applications. I have quite a few illustrations this morning, too. I don't know that I always would use this many, but if it'll help drive this point home, then I'd like to do so. Let's ask the Lord's blessings on our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to look into your word together, that we might grow thereby. Father, some of us are still eating 
or drinking milk, but we need to learn to eat some meat. Lord, I pray you'd help us to see the meat of your word this morning in a way that would help us to want more of it, to long for it, as if we were in a dry and thirsty land, for indeed we are. Spiritual darkness is all around us, and if we don't strengthen ourselves in you, we are more likely to fall prey to lies and deceptions around us. So God, meet with us, we ask this morning, and we'll thank you for it. So we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So setting the word stage, just a play on words, <clears throat> here we're going to concentrate the whole message this morning on the word of God, and I want to speak first of all to satisfying your hunger. Now, part of the problem here is I'm assuming that you have a hunger, but the truth of the matter is we often don't. So we're looking at some passages that help us with this. Deuteronomy 8.3 tells us this. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. Therein lies part of the crux of what I'd like to highlight this morning, but I'll probably not spend as much time there as I need to. But if we don't develop a hunger for the word and see our need for it, we don't go there very often. We're too good at solving our problems by ourselves based on previous knowledge and experience that doesn't really cut the mustard. We need to see God speak to us in his word and growing in hunger when challenges to life come ought to drive us there. You know what we do too often times is when challenges come, we try to solve it our way and if it doesn't work, we get upset, we get frustrated, we get critical. and We bypass the very one who is waiting in the wings for us to come to him and show us the answer. So the Lord deals with the Israelites in the early days this way. I humbled you and I allowed you to hunger on purpose. Do you suppose it's possible that sometimes God lets us hunger on purpose, but we'll start looking to him? And I fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Another one, Matthew chapter 4, as we set, set the word stage for where I'm going to go this morning. <clears throat> you know this one. But he answered and said, now who, to whom is he speaking here? Not exactly the kind of conversation you'd want to find yourself in, right? Being tempted by the devil three times directly, and directly he responds, how? With the word of God. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And one more, John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Now let's look at getting a better perspective on some of this. For many of us, the word of God isn't new. We maybe were... Uh, young at one time in the Lord and everything was exciting to us and we really took it in and then but weren't sure how to use it and as a like a meal we maybe would eat three to four times I don't know about you but I eat probably four times a day my wife will tell you that's true if we just knock off that fourth one around 10 o'clock who knows what that would mean but I told her we're only interested in the inside man so it, don't worry about that right she doesn't buy that one nor do I. So we eat regularly, and none of us likes to miss a meal, right? We, we do pretty well at guarding that time. But what would it do for our lives if we went to the Word three or four times a day? I wonder if anyone's ever tried the practice of getting out Scripture and reading something from Scripture every time you sit down to eat. We pray oftentimes, hopefully you do before you eat, but have you ever read Scripture before you ate and got your spiritual food first? and then your physical food. So the perspective here can't be missed as we look at the way the Lord lines this up. And when you eat, do you just sit down and eat because you have to? I suppose some of you do if you don't. I don't know what that means to not have an appetite. I'm hungry all day long. It's a fight just to get down to three or four meals a day. But I don't find myself wishing to be in the Word like that. And that bugs me. And I wish it would bug you too. Because that's what the Lord is aligning the two, aligning the spiritual food with, is our daily food. Today you'll hear folks talk about their soulmate. They're trying to find their soulmate. The word is still used, <clears throat> but here's a better one for us Christians. 
when's the last time you in, enjoyed some really good soul food? Food that helps your soul. It makes you thrive on the inside. I want you to try something different if I can be practical here. Next time you have your devotions, and I, I encourage you to have them in the morning so you can enjoy the benefits of what you see throughout the day. But before you even begin to read, and you may have a reading plan and it might have you in a certain place, but before you even read, say, Lord, please help me to find something here this morning that I need. And get away from the box checking mentality. It's so critical here to understand the difference. If you have a reading list with boxes to check on dates and so on, before you know it, you've read for months, and the only goal was to be able to check that box. So you couldn't tell anybody anything that you ate from the Word in the last week, perhaps not even in the last day. So as we get a better perspective on the Word, we could ask the Lord when we start, Lord, don't let me put my Bible down until you give me something. And read expectantly. I think the Lord will bless you. Feeding, yes. Box checking, no. Read until you get something, okay? Thirdly here in this first point, I want to I want to bring some fair questions forward. Uh, you may ask them. Uh, maybe you won't, but they're, they're worth looking into. Tell me if this is not a fair assumption of you. You like the Word of God. You even read the Word of God. And you're comfortable to some degree. You think the Lord likes your plan. But you haven't really feasted on it in quite some time. This will be kind of humorous, but I'm, like I said, I'm down to earth. My wife has been pumping the fruits and vegetables to me for years, and I'm glad. I know she loves me. And, uh, you know, if I had my way, I would go places that I probably shouldn't go. And so on my way into work many mornings, I will bring food with me because I've got to drive 22 minutes. I might as well kill two birds with one stone. I'm thrifty like that. So I don't eat at home. I read my Bible, do all those things, get ready, say goodbye, and I hit the road, and I get my coffee, and I start feeding myself from this little Tupperware thing, right? And I might get a little bit of savory stuff, but then i got to finish up with the vegetables, and I like tomatoes in the morning. Some of you call those vegetables, some of you call them fruits, but whatever it is, I like those in the morning, so that becomes my vegetable. And then I'll get to some fruit, and it varies all across the board. And every once in a while, she'll stick these blackberries in there and these raspberries. And you know what raspberries and blackberries do to your teeth? They stick seeds in all these funny places. And then you're looking for a toothpick on the way to work. Now, I even carry those. Yes, I have a little bit of OCD. It comes out in various ways. And so I'll be picking out these blackberry seeds on the way to work. And you ever notice something about blackberry seeds? They taste really good second time around, so to speak. But you want to know something? I have never asked my wife to make a meal out of blackberry seeds, and with good reason, because it was never meant to be a meal. Some of you are sucking on and rechewing blackberry seeds from your word, from the Bible, and expecting it to sustain you for the day. Oh, it might taste good for a little bit, but it's not going to last very long. And so what will you fill your next hunger pain with becomes the big question. So that's a fair question. Do you long for it? Do you feast on it? <clears throat> have you ever left your Bible time feeling like I have absolutely nothing to show for it? Have you ever read your Bible and you can read a whole chapter and your mind starts wandering? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, double-minded in that sense, just like some of you. I don't know how I do that, but my eyes have ran over the whole chapter, and I get about three quarters of the way through, and my mind all of a sudden reminds me, it's probably the Spirit of God, and says, do you know anything that you just read? You've been thinking about what you're going to do at work today. You've been thinking about this problem issue you've got to solve. You've been thinking about this car problem because the engine light's on again, and what are you going to do? Who's going to pay for that? And you don't have a clue what I just said. I'm trying to answer that problem, all of those problems for you, if you would just join me in the Word. I literally sometimes am so frustrated when I do that that I force myself to back up and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to start again. And I try to put all that aside and I start reading again. I'll reread that same chapter and make sure that I get something out of it that can help me for the day and take some time to truly commune with my God. I want to encourage you to do the same. Here's another fair question. What if you went into the Word of God thirsty like a deer pants for water? 
If you really went into it thirsty and longing for it. When I'm really thirsty, I'm tempted to get angry with my wife because certain beverages are not in the refrigerator where I'm expecting them to be. And shame on me. And some of you know I drink a little ginger ale at night. I've always enjoyed just a little ginger ale. I, I jokingly say I like a mixed drink at night after everything's slowing down. And used to be a little bit of, I'd put ginger ale and mix it with grape juice and it tastes like grape Fanta. Then I got tired of that and I started mixing um, lemonade with my ginger ale and it tasted like Fresca. And uh, there's, you know, you just mix some kind of fruit juice with ginger ale and it, it probably resembles something you drank as a child. We are out of ginger ale. And so I'm tempted to be angry. I might have even sounded a little bit pert because she does all the shopping. I, I push grocery lists so that we don't run out of things. I encourage her to stock up. She'll buy two boxes or um, what do you call them? Tubes of toothpaste that come in a, what do you call that? They come in a box, I guess. I'll encourage you to buy 16. And if they're on sale, buy 28. And we won't have to worry about it for another year. And uh, so that's, that's me and just being transparent. No ginger ale. <clears throat> So I thought, okay, how can I spruce this up and not be angry? So I did one of these other things that will make me healthy at the same time. I poured a glass of water. Well, actually, I went to the freezer. I got out some frozen blueberries, put those in first. I added some water, and they become my ice, and they become my flavoring. And by the time I got done with that glass of water, the berries were still there, so guess what I did? Went and filled it up again. And the flavor continued to ooze out. And I was thoroughly refreshed. And then I thought, hmm, can't let those blueberries go to waste. I went and got my long ice cream spoon, and I'm digging out the blueberries. They were even better than the drink. You know why it was so good? Because I was so thirsty. I wanted something, and I thought I wanted ginger ale. But what I really needed was some blueberry water. Now, you can do with that all kinds of things. If you have any frozen fruit, throw it in there. You'd be amazed at how good it tastes as it melts into it, and then you eat it when it's all done. If you really want to splurge, you throw some ice cream in there, too. <laughs> but you understand my point. Here's the fair questions. If you don't come to the Word of God as if you're longing for it, then you're probably not going to get a whole lot because you didn't have a cavity ready to be filled. You didn't have a thirst ready to be quenched. You weren't longing. And then there's also this one, gaining new insights into its value. <clears throat> Now here I want to take you through some practical verses. And again, I'm just laying some groundwork here because I'm not so sure everybody really loves and longs for the Word of God. But let me just give you a sampling of what it's designed to do and see if it doesn't whet your appetite. And so, <clears throat> do you have trouble raising your children? Does anybody find that easy? And if you're past the children's stage and you're off to grandchildren, do those parents which are your children expect you to help? raise them? My kids do. When their kids come to my house, they know they're going to be under Papa's rules. And I'm going to support and reinforce every disciplinary action my children expect me to uphold. Because I want those children to meet the same brick wall in every house they go to. And if it's not okay to take cookies without asking at your house, it's not okay at my house. And so the point is, we all need help in this area one way or another. Deuteronomy 6.2 helps us that you may fear the Lord your God and to keep all the statutes and the commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. You know that knowing the Bible helps you to raise your children more biblically and correctly and more joyfully? How about you're tired of sinning and you don't really like what you do when you let your flesh run away with you? Oh, there's a verse for that too. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you? When's the last time you started memorizing scripture? Try 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's a slew of them. Psalm 119, 9, 10, and 11 all can help you in this area. Do you have go-to verses? You need to have them. If you'd get the benefit that the word of God meant for you, you've got to get these and make them your own and grow thereby. Do you have struggles with looking at the glimmer and the glistening gold of the world and being attracted to it? I do. I get the Jeep washed and I just marvel over how pretty she is. And then I have to catch myself. Oh, it's just a car, the Spirit of the Lord says. I said, yes, thank you for giving me a car that's sparkling, Lord. It's pretty. It's nice. Do you like your gold rings and your diamonds? 
Do you like your jewelry, your earrings? What is it that really grabs our attention? Do you know what the Bible says about some of those things? My son, if you receive my words, they're all found in here, and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline, that is, lean into with your ear of wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. See the perspective that God tries to give us? I have seen countless women go up to a young lady who just got a new diamond ring. Some sweet guy proposed to her, and the bigger the rock, the better, and the bigger the ooing and the aahing goes on. But I've never seen another woman go up to another woman who's reading her Bible and say, oh, what are you studying? Oh, that looks like a really good passage. What are you getting out of that? It's just shining out at me. I can see it in your eyes. What is that there? See how easily we get fuzzy about the more important things in life that begin with the word. It's equal to your daily food. We read this one earlier, but he answered, said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But most of us will try that if we can get away with it. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It increases your faith. Some of you might say, well, I've been reading the Bible and I just don't feel like I'm, my faith is so weak. You're really telling me that you don't trust the promises of God. Our faith is built on the promises of God. If God said it, he will keep it. And our faith can be relying on the trustworthy one. And so he gives us verses like this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I've often taken the middle out. I'm sure Miss Cannon could give me a mathematical equation that I could relate this to. So then faith comes by the word of God. It's not complicated, folks, is it? I'm not preaching something that's difficult. But sometimes we don't do the things that we know that we should. And so that brings me to my second point. How do we become doers of the word and not hearers only? You know, have you ever noticed with a new convert how their appetite is so quick to be taking in as much as they can? They just are asking all these good questions. They want to know, what is the scoop here? And, and you haven't been asked those questions for so long, you feel stupid because you don't know where to start. And you have to relax and get them out of your presence so you go back to thinking through these things. And, oh yeah, I know the answer to that. And fortunately, they're patient, they give you some time, and you do a little research, write some things down, print some stuff up, and you give them something, and they go and they feed some more. Doesn't that excite you? But there is a problem, though. Be careful. There are a lot of converts, new converts, who start out quick, but then they slow down, they don't apply what they're learning, and it does them no good. And we realize a great maxim of life. Education alone isn't enough. This is part of the problem with our culture. They throw money and education at every problem and think that's going to solve it. Here's the difficulty. The average person couldn't care less if they understand what would work if they tried it. They just don't have the will to do it. So it falls on deaf ears and the money is wasted and the education is wasted. And the same can be true in the Christian realm. You can teach people things but if they don't make it their own and become a doer of it, then what good is it? It doesn't do them any good, does it? It's a nice wording, but it just stays over there like a picture on the wall, and no one goes and behaves accordingly. So let's look at this verse together. <clears throat> We're really looking for obedience here. I have to break this up into two slides. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word... Notice all my verses, all the songs keep bringing us back to the word of God, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now note that, that's a great message in and of itself. You think when you read the word of God and then you set it down and you don't obey it, that it's just, you know, it's okay. No, it's not. You have just entered into the realm of deception. You have lied to yourself in believing that God is now not going to hold you responsible. You know the truth, you are responsible. You are no longer ignorant. It's helpful to be motivated when you see some of these things. And he goes on, he says, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man, and here comes the illustration, observing his natural face 
in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So again, it's straightforward, but we find there that education isn't enough. Knowledge leads to education, if you will, but it must lead at some point to obedience. Otherwise, the train isn't going anywhere. And you may have experienced that before. Have you ever gotten up and got ready for church and you looked in the mirror and there was toothpaste in the corner of your mouth that you missed? Do you leave it there and just wait for somebody at church to tell you? Of course not. Why? Well, we could fill in that blank with different reasons. I'm too vain for that or I don't want to look that way and look like I'm a you know, you fill in the blank. I don't want to go too far there because just don't. <clears throat> you always, always, always clean it off, don't you? My wife and I are at the age now where our skin sensors aren't quite what they used to be, and I can carry around something from a bagel, a piece of cream cheese right here. I have no clue it's there. And sometimes she's not even paying attention, and I'll say, honey, we're going into a public place now. Maybe we're going to do something like, you know, be in church or some activity, I said, am I missing something? And she'll, and she, oh, yeah, I don't think you want to go in there with that cream cheese on your chin and the olive hanging out of it, right? We always do that. It's a no-brainer. So is it, how is it then that we look into the Word of God and it says, oh, you're a little proud today, Randy. What are you going to do about that? And we put it down and we just leave the pride hanging there as we go off into the world for everybody to see. Because here's the dirty little secret. You think that nobody else notices, but they already see it. We told our kids this over and over again. Said, you think that lying is going to be okay because nobody sees it, but we already know. Do you want me to tell you how I already know you lied? And we could give them the evidence. And then we'd say, why do you bother to try to hide it? We all know already. Just grow with it, live with it, fix it. Some of our children didn't like their voice. It's like, why worry about it? This is the only voice we've ever heard. They thought it sounded like something else coming through their nasal passages and everything. They said, don't worry about it. Roll with it. This is all we've ever heard. We don't know that other voice you think that's you're hearing. This is fine with us. Grow into it. Be okay with it. It's all right. Fix things when they need fixing and accept things when they're okay. The Word of God helps us with those things. <clears throat> The word picture that he gives us here is one that we all should be relate to. And I would encourage you every time in the next few days that you look into a mirror to check out how things are, is the hair right and everything, that you let this passage just take a minute to seep into your soul. Meditate on it. Say, okay, Lord, I look good here. The makeup's all right. Both earrings are still on. I have to use girls. I'm sorry. We guys, we don't really do a whole lot. We just get up and you know and you're, sometimes it offends you. We just quickly run a brush or something through our hair, and then we're off and running. Well, we do have to shave, and but my wife never worries about that. It's mostly a, a girl thing, and you can relate to that. But when you're getting ready for the day, do you stop and look in the mirror and ask yourself, okay, Lord, what could I fix that you see that's a little deeper than the face and the skin? And just have a conversation with the Lord and see if he doesn't speak to you. I guarantee that he will, because he wants you to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Let me give you another illustration. Uh, recently, I, I oversee some of the 7th and 8th uh, yeah, and eighth graders uh, during the week. To, there's a, uh, just something that's worked out, and they need an arrangement that would allow these six young people to be with oversight for about 40 minutes every Friday. So I agreed to do it, and I come up with projects, and we do stuff. We, every week, they pick up the rocks around those last four islands over there because the rocks always seem to find their way out into the driveway and and now I'm going to pretty soon start teaching them how to rake or blow the leaves off and and I'll usually take them into the garage and get them to help me with something in there uh, this week I think we're going to pull desks out of the upstairs for a need that we have in the fifth and sixth grade that Miss Carrie's been asking me about and uh, the other day we were building a a uh, firewood holder you ever seen those things that kind of come up there's a base and they come up the sides and they sell everything in the smallest box they can sell it in these days so they can ship it easier. And we get it, now we have to put all this stuff together. 
Well, for some odd reason, there was no directions. There were no directions in this box. And so we were all looking and like, how could they not send us any directions? That doesn't make any sense because there was a whole bunch of screws and bolts and there were different legs and things and it wasn't obvious how they went. So guess what we did? We went to looking at the picture. <laughs> Imagine that. So we're looking at the picture. Oh, there's a joint there and a joint there. So that must be these pieces. There's got to be screws that go there because everywhere there's a joint, got to put a bolt or something. And we worked it out together. We managed to get it all together. And then it was functional. Do you know that we never once had the thought cross our minds that we'll just look at the picture and memorize it for another day and just walk away and leave the, the pile in the floor of the garage? That never dawned on us. We took the instruction of the picture and we turned it into what it was supposed to be. And there and again lies that simple illustration. The mirror of the word is meant to help you. But if you don't see it as such, you won't see what the Lord is trying to do. And by the way, there's a great uh, picture in verse 21. I think I'd have to back up one. He says here, and receive with meekness. Therein lies the key word because sometimes we're too proud to look into the Bible and let it teach us. Get over it. Submit to the word. And then receive it, what? The implanted word. Now, I want to go back to the KJV because if you grew up with the KJV, do you remember the word it used there? It translate the, translate the, translates that Greek word in graft, to graft in. There's a whole illustration that Paul's go through, Paul goes through with grafting in people into the Lord Jesus Christ because Israel didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And back here in this verse, he's talking about the same idea. Have you ever heard of grafting apple trees? Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. But if you spoke to Les Crane, he would tell you all about it because his dad experimented with some like 20 different varieties of apple into the one tree that he was practicing these things on. And I'm like, can you really do that? He goes, oh yeah. He said, my dad would want to know how many he could get away with. Here's an apple branch, the apple tree branch, and I don't know what all those represent, but do you see the buds growing? It's actually working. Those little and I don't know what the word is for them, sprigs, there's probably a name for them, are getting their lifeblood, their energy, their sustenance from where? You might call it the mother tree. And God uses this illustration for us. Receive the, engraft, the word that grafts you in, if you will. The word of God is what keeps us tight to Jesus Christ and growing thereby. And without him, you can do nothing. So God gives us all these sweet illustrations that show us just where to find our nutrition for godly living, just where to find our soul food. Some might say those sprigs get their lifeblood from the bigger branch. <clears throat> Let me take you to another one that you're more familiar with, perhaps. John 15, you remember this? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, dwell with me, live within me, I within you, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You know why the branch withers? You ever picked up sticks that blew off your tree? Could you pick that stick up? This happens to me every time I mow the lawn. I got to go pick up all the branches first before I mow. You pick them up and stick them in the ground and hope for a beautiful tree one day? You never do that because they're dead. There's no life in them. Now, what's the picture that I want to challenge you with right here? Can anybody say it? Do I want to look like a dead branch with no life in me? Because that's what the scripture is asking in this passage here. There's invaluable truth here, folks, for us. If we would only draw nearer to Jesus and his word and begin to live like we're sustained and nourished and blessed in our souls by what he's able to do. Now, <clears throat> this implies that you are in Christ. Pastor Rob has made some big ado about that lately, and I'm not sure you're still getting it. But scripture talks about being in Christ. When you're in Christ, these things become yours. And this is an example of this. When you're in Christ... You are a branch that is grafted in. You are adopted. This is another word the Bible uses. And God is your God and he has your life 
in his hand, and he's going to live through you so that you look more Christ-like and you become more used for his glory. It's a wonderful place to be. But you've got to first be in Christ. Are you in Christ or are you still on the outside just nibbling around the edges? Don't play that game. You never know how long of a life you'll have. And I say this to young people too, even in the high school. Teenagers think they're invincible. They run around, well, I'm speaking for the guys now. They run around in their cars going too fast, taking chances, and sliding off the road, even when it's not wintertime yet, and telling me about the next day as if it was a lot of fun. I said, you know, it's only a lot of fun until you hit that big maple tree that's still there. It's never moved. Your dad could tell you it was there when he ran into it. And you hit that tree, and it's all going to be different. Do you really want to live like that? I know I don't. I want to be in Christ. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. My sins are washed away as far as east is from the west, and I will never again answer for them because Jesus Christ took them all. And he wants to go beyond that and now bear much fruit through Randy Boardman and every one of you who takes the name of Jesus Christ. None of us is without, with exception. We are all here to serve the living God and look like a tree that's been planted by the Savior and growing leaves and branches that are alive and well and are helping other people to know how to live too. <clears throat> we use this quote around here to be an encouragement in, in discipleship groups, but it, it applies in all cases. Get into the Word until... Anybody finish it with me? Thank you. Let's say it one more time. Get into the Word until the Word gets into you. You get into the Word as you read it and you study it, but if it's not coming out in your life, you're not more godly, you're not more humble, you're not more serious about spiritual things, you're not more submissive, you're not more joyful, you're not more wise. If these fruits are not coming out of you, then you need to get back into the Word until it does. And find out where is the problem. What is stopping it from making its way into my soul and coming out in my everyday life? Folks, this is deep stuff when you start looking at it like that. When I went to Bob Jones University, I had to sit through an orientation class, and the dean of students got up and said, you know, we wish we could give you this outline that would really be one sentence in this booklet, and they call it the handbook. We even have to use one here. I wish it could just open up and say, no sinning allowed, or choose to be godly, and that would solve everything. Choose to love your neighbor as yourself. I said, but it doesn't work that way. Not everybody has a heart that's desirous to do those things. And so we keep teaching ourselves and preaching to ourselves until we get it right. Get into the Word till the Word gets into you. <clears throat> feasting, uh, excuse me, feeding, feasting, or forgetting. How are you currently handling the Word of God? What impact is it having upon you? This is a simple truth this morning. I want to give you one more illustration. When we were traveling as missionaries and our children were younger, uh, they would get sick of it as anyone would. We were basically living out of a van, living out of a van, homeschooling in the van, and then when we got reprieves from the van, we were in some stranger's house getting used to a separate, separate set of circumstances that was all new to us. It was challenging. And when we could, we would try to remind our children that, but we're getting to do things other people don't get to do. We're in Toronto, so we're going to take in a Toronto Raptors basketball game tonight. And the boys would get all excited, and sometimes the girls would too. And there was another time when we were in the Philly area, and we got tickets to a Philadelphia 76ers game. And my son was a rabid Allen Iverson fan, and so he got to see Allen Iverson. Oh, everything was great. And there were other games and things that we did. We tried to do field trips that the girls would enjoy more. And here, where am I going to this? In every case where I was able to take them to a professional game, do you think that I went to the ticket booth and bought the least expensive ticket so we could sit the furthest away from the game we could possibly get? Nobody ever does that, do they? No, we went and bought the best ticket we could get and afford, and we sat as close to the action as we could get. Folks, are you sitting close to the action? Are you still keeping it at a distance? Because the further away it is, the harder it is to see and the harder it is to enjoy. Don't let that be you. I challenge you this morning, don't let that be you. Read it, love it, grow by it. 
your soul, your life, and your family will thank you for it. Try it. What do you have to lose? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so good to me and my family through your word. And sometimes I think we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg. And there's so much more that you have left for us. And Lord, I pray for these folks this morning that you might reach down in their hearts and flip a switch that makes them long and hunger for your word. So many of our problems today could be so more, much more quickly alleviated if we just did what your word instructs us to do. But we must know what it says. We must get familiar with it. And that we must be doers of the word and not just hearers if we would truly enjoy the blessings of it. Oh God, I pray for these dear loved ones here today that you would take your word of God and make it thrilling to them. Take away the lies of the evil one when he swirls around our heads and says, oh, you don't need that much time. You've already read a chapter, that's good enough. Check your box and go, it's good, it's good, it's all right. Help us to see past those things and ask you, Lord, what do you think is okay? Should I read a little bit more? What are you trying to tell me today? And build our relationship with you because you have meant to know us and work through your word in ways that we can't really fully understand, but we know you've said it. It is meant to be our daily bread. So, Father, help us to feast on it and to grow thereby. And we'll thank you in advance for all that you'll do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.